Loving Father in heaven, Lord, it is a blessing and a privilege to be able to come together and open up your word and study and fellowship together. Under all the circumstances, Father, around us, you have gave us such a great blessing and we are grateful. We, Father, to take, we pray, Father, to take full use of the opportunities you give us. That we, Father, would have our lives fully surrendered to thee. And be ready, Father, to go give the message to the Levites and to the world. We pray to use this precious time, Father, to continue studying, seeking wisdom from heaven and guidance from above. Seeking, Father, greater skill in using the methodology to hear you speak to us, as thus saith the Lord, through the parables. Father, we pray, we pray to hear you speak to us plainly. <coughs> we pray to always remember the reason for the hope that is in us. It is your great mercy, Father, that is that hope that is in us. It is your word that created all things. It is your word that has brought us to the salvation place that we are today. And may we, Father, sing praises to your holy name that others might see you in us. We ask you to be with us as we go through our studies today, Father. Sharpen our minds, Father, through your words of truth and continue to knit us together that we might become one with you in all that we do, all that we say, and all that we think. We thank you, Father, and we pray you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Let's see if somebody would like to um, lead out. We can take turns, however you want to do, with going through um, chapter 33 of Acts of the Apostles. I could start. Okay. All right. So chapter 33, laboring under difficulties, and this is Acts of the Apostles. While Paul was careful to set before his converts the plan, the plain teaching of scripture regarding the proper support of the work of God, while he claimed for himself as a minister of the gospel, the power to forbear working, which is 1 Corinthians 9, 6, at secular employment as a means of self-support, yet at various times during his ministry in the great centers of civilization, he wrought at a hand, handicraft for his own maintenance. Among the Jews, physical toil was not thought strange or degrading. Through Moses, the Hebrews had been instructed to train their children to industrious habits, and it was regarded as a sin to allow the youth to grow up in ignorance of physical labor. Even though a child was to be educated for holy office, a knowledge of practical life was thought essential. Every youth, whether his parent were rich or poor, was taught some trade. Those parents who neglected to provide such a training for their children were looked upon as departing from the instruction of the Lord. In accordance with this custom, Paul had early learned the trade of tent making. Before he became a disciple of Christ, Paul had occupied a high position and was not dependent upon manual labor for support, but afterward, when he had used all his means in furthering the cause of Christ, he restored, a, I'm sorry, he resorted at times to his trade to gain a livelihood. Especially was this the case when he labored in places where his motives might have been misunderstood. It is at Thessalonica that we first read of Paul's working with his hands in self-supporting labor while preaching the word. Writing to the church of believer, believers there, he reminded them that he might have been burdensome, burden, burdensome to them and added, ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto you any, unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. 
um, 1 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 9, thank you. And again, in his second epistle to them, he declared that he and his fellow labor, labor, um, I'm sorry, my eyes aren't working with me. Okay, labor while with them had not eaten any man's bread for not. Night and day we worked, he wrote, that we might not be chargeable to any of you, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensemble, in, ensemble onto you to follow us. Second, I have a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah, please. When you think about, because we're many of us are working, right? And we're trying to study and trying to learn all these different things. And, and you look at what he did. What do you suppose Paul, um, when he was working, trying to think of the way to ask the question, when he was working, uh, now think of understanding that times were different, but what do you suppose his income, in his income level, did he desire? Is that the way to ask that question? Just enough to cover his food and just and enough to cover, yeah, what he, his basic needs. Right. And, and how did he get to that place? I mean, because some of us might want to support a, a, a nice house and fancy things and fancy meals and all that kind of stuff. How do you suppose he got to that place? By dying to self. Because he, he only wanted to do God's work. And so he was only, he didn't want the house and stuff. He wanted to minister to others. And so he was only getting enough to support his needs, his basic needs. Yeah. And why was it, it doesn't say, or I don't think it does, maybe it does when we go on, because it commented, it, she comments that it to, how did she word it? Um, he used his trade, right? But why was he doing it? Where was that word, what it said? Um, that he would not be counted as burdensome to them. Yeah. It, that, he, that when he labored in places, his motives might be misunderstood. What might they think his motives would be? Gaining wealth. Yeah. I'm going to come preach to you so you can supply me with everything I need. So those that, that so you might labor, we might labor with some that don't understand this. And we don't want them to ever feel that we labor for them because we want their money. Did I say some? Yeah. Um, it's a very big contrast compared to our churches today. Um, let's say like when we have um, the prophetic meetings, you know, um, the ones yeah. they have every year. Yeah. So it's like they will, you know, after each, I don't know, every so often they will ask for money. It's not just once, but it's more. Yeah. You know, ask for more. So it's a great big contrast of how God wants the church and how the church is today. Yeah, those things always bothered me because, I don't know, I, 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 again, it's probably my simple background, but it bothered me from the beginning when I would see how much time, effort, money, decorations, the stage, all that other stuff. It was like such a waste. And I always remembered, preach the word. You just preach the word. You preach the truth. Those that want the truth are going to come and hear it. But they think they have to do all the, and I remember being told by a pastor's wife about how much they actually practice and rehearse, and they feel they have to keep up with, with, uh, with the world and how to get people's attention. And God is real simple. Just preach the word. And so when you work among those that might be thinking that you're preaching for money, then you do what you have to do to take care of yourself. But how much care can you put into sharing the gospel? I'm speaking in my own self too. Where do we draw the line in our own basic needs? Um, and that's not a question I'm asking for anybody else. It's just something to think about. Where do we draw the lines when it comes to our own basic needs? Because everything we list, if we were to list out our basic needs, everything of our basic needs takes away time, 
from the gospel, sharing the gospel, learning the gospel to be able to give it to others. And so it's just something to think about. Where do we draw the line? Because the more time we have to learn and share the gospel and do God's work, that's, that's what we want to be doing. And cutting back whatever we think our bait, because we might, I know I'm guilty. What are my basic needs? And, and do we slim down our basic needs to where we can be that vessel? Just some thoughts. Great thoughts. Thank you. Does somebody else want to take um, start reading? Yes, I can. Um, at Thessalonica, Paul had met those who refused to work with their hands. It was of this class that he afterward wrote. There are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are at busy bodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. While laboring in Thessalonica, Paul had been careful to set before such ones a right example. Even when we were with you, he wrote, this we commanded you, that if any of you would not work, neither should he eat. In every age, Satan has sought to impair the efforts of God's servants by introducing into the church a spirit of fanaticism. Thus it, thus it was in Paul's day, and thus it was in later centuries during the time of the Reformation. Wycliffe, Luther, and many others who blessed the world by their influence and their face encountered the wiles by which the enemy seeks to lead into fanaticism over zealous and balanced and unsanctified minds. Misguided souls have thought that the attainment of true holiness carries the mind above all earthly thoughts and leads men to refrain wholly from labor. Others, taking extreme views of certain texts of scripture, have thought that that it is sin to work, that Christians should take no thought concerning the temporal welfare of themselves or their families, but should devote their lives wholly to spiritual things. The teaching and example of the Apostle Paul are a rebuke to such extreme views. Paul was, was not wholly dependent upon the labor of his hands for support while at Thessalonica. Referring later to these experiences in that city, he wrote, to the Philippian believers in acknowledgement of the gifts he had received from them while, while there, saying, even in Thessalonica, yet he sent once and again unto my necessity. Notwithstanding the fact that he received his, this help, he was careful to set before the Thessalonians an example of diligence, so that none could rightfully accuse him of covetousness, and also that those who held fanatical views regarding manual labor might, might be given a practical rebuke. That's really interesting. So he, so he's setting the example, but even though some in, in another place who understand what he's doing are supporting him, mm -hmm. he's still setting the example of working so that, so that the, these others in this other location don't get the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. So when Paul first visited Corinth, he found himself among a people who were suspicious of the motives of strangers. The Greeks of, on the sea coast, were, sea coast were keen traders. So long had they, trained, had they trained themselves in sharp business practices that they had come to believe that gain was godliness and that to make money, whether by fair means or power, was commendable. Paul was acquainted with their characteristics and he would give them no occasion for saying that he preached the gospel in order to enrich himself. He might justly have claimed support from his Corinthian hearers, but this right he was willing to forego, lest his usefulness and success as a minister should be injured by the unjust suspicion that he was preaching the gospel for gain. He would seek to remove all occasion for misrepresentation that the force of his message might not be lost. So he put the message, the, their understanding the message before making things easier for himself. Mm. So soon after his arrival at Corinth, Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, 
lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They were on this, these were of the same craft with himself, banished by the decree of Claudius, which commanded all Jews to leave Rome. Aquila and Priscilla had come to Corinth, they, where they established a business as manufacturers of tents. Paul made, injury, made inquiry concerning them and learning that they feared God and were seeking to avoid the contaminating influence with which they were surrounded. He abode with them and wrote, and he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Later, Silas and Timothy joined Paul at Corinth. This brethren brought with them funds from the churches in Macedonia for the support of the work. In his second letter to the believers in Corinth, written after he had raised up a strong church there, Paul reviewed his manner of life among them. Have I committed an offense, he asked, and in abasing myself that you may be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other, I robbed churches taking wages of them to do your service. And when I present with you, and when I, and when I was present with you and wanted, and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome to you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Paul tells why he had followed this course in Corinth. It was that he might give no cause for reproach to them with desire occasion. While he had worked at tent making, he had also labored faithfully in the proclamation of the gospel. He himself declares of his labors, Truly, the signs of an apostle were, were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders, in mighty deeds. And he adds, for what, is, for what is it wherein you are inferior to other churches, except it be that, I'm, that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I'm ready to come to you, and I will not be, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Seek not what is yours, but I seek you. That's, mm -hmm. um, I think it's this very powerful, convincing argument. Yeah. During the long period of his ministry in Ephesus, where the three years he carried forward an aggressive evangelistic efforts throughout that region, Paul again worked at his trade. I, concerning this tents, do you, if any of you uh, know what kind of tents are those? Like, is this the tents that, I guess back then, my suspicion is that back then the ho homes are not easy to build. So, so many would probably live in tents. Is That's that what I thought, that the, the, the tents are people that live in them. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? This was during the time that Rome was everywhere, right? Because Rome was in power. Uh -huh. And a big part of their, who they were, probably the biggest part of their citizenship was in the army. And so the army would go around and, you know, make garrisons and they would have all these places. So I think they would need tents. I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it would be like a, the equivalent today would be finding the need today that would give us a trade to supply our basic needs while we do the gospel. And for his day, it seemed to be tents were something that were um, needed, necessary. Yeah, in our time we have um, the medical work and that's why I've talked to many patients and my mom and I always talked about this. It's a two year trade school. There are so many different types of trade schools. You learn a trade. You don't have to go into a university and do all this philosophizing. You just get a trade. And they pay really well and you have something that supports you when you need it. Yeah. You know, instead of putting all that time into the education that, um, not that education in itself is bad, but there's a lot of corrupt things in the education system. And One what of, you need is a trade. Nellen White taught, taught, taught about that to teach. And we already read it in one of these 
previous passages to to um, to have physical labor that it was necessary to have and we needed to understand practical labor I think is what she said so understanding practical labor to sustain yourself through this you were going to say something sorry yeah um, one of the biggest issues is there's a really interesting hierarchy of degrees and people who have a higher degree get more respect and people who don't are less respected yeah. and treated not. so you know what I mean that whole system I mean there's levels to learning and I understand that but there's certain things that you're required to take to get a degree like a bachelor's degree you take so many classes that have nothing to do with your field yeah and it's just for business sake and then the person who gets that degree is regarded as someone who's very very intelligent compared to other people it's like what was the point yeah so. well it's about pride and arrogance it's like if you want to serve the lord do you need a degree to serve the lord and what's you know what makes what gives us looking at the woman at the well what gave jesus joy it was to to feed this woman the gospel and so we don't care about titles we don't care about degrees we don't care about all the prestige we just care about being able to be as practical as can be to be able to have our time learning the word and being able to go out and preach the word amen you know when i was a flight attendant there were lots of applicant uh, of people who are applying for a flight attendant job that they had master's degrees and i was like why did you even want to be a flight attendant they're like because we can't hardly ever even get a job with our masters yeah so they they just you know it, it was just kind of sad so i guess it depends there too where you're at all those all those years and all that money they were all paying student loans and then they go and get a job as a flight attendant I just thought it was weird. Yeah. <clears throat> That's this world that we live in. So, <clears throat> during the long period of his ministry in Ephesus, where for three years he carried forward an aggressive evangelistic effort throughout the re that region, Paul again worked at his trade. In Ephesus, as in Corinth, the apostle was cheered by the presence of Aquila and Priscilla, who, was, who had accompanied him on his return to Asia at the close of his second missionary journey. There were some who objected to Paul's toiling with his hands, declaring that it was inconsistent with the work of a gospel minister. Why should Paul, a minister of the highest rank, thus connect mechanical work with, his, with the preaching of the word? Was not the laborer worthy of his hire? Why should he spend in making tents time that to all appearance could be put to better account? But Paul did not regard as lost the time thus spent. As he worked with Achilles, he kept in touch with the great teacher, losing no opportunity of witnessing for the Savior and of helping those who need help. His mind was ever reaching, reaching out for spiritual knowledge. He gave his fellow workers instruction in spiritual things and he also set an example of industry and sorrowness. He was a quick, skillful worker, diligent in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. As he worked at his trade, the apostle had access to a class of people that he could not otherwise have reached. He showed his associates that skill in, in the common arts is a gift from God who provides both the gift and the wisdom to use it right. Um, he taught that even in everyday toil, God is to be honored. His toil hardened hands detracted nothing from the force of his pathetic appeals as a, as a Christian minister. Paul sometimes worked night and day, not only for his own support, but that he might assist his fellow laborers. He shared his earnings with Luke and he helped Timothy. He even suffered hunger at times that he might relieve the necessities of others. His was an unselfish life. Toward the close of his ministry, on the occasion of his farewell talk to the elders of Ephesus at, Mil at Miletus, he could lift up before them his tail-worn hands, tail ha toil-worn hands, and say, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yeah. You yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities 
and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Can I say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, back, sorry, back on the comments that were made about like um, um, having a job that, or I'm just paraphrasing what I understood, having a job to um, basically provide for the means that you need. And, and also, you know, the school lean portion to it as well. And that, and being of this world where education is a part of the training, you know, to get a job is just part of that system, which is so much into that, you know, that, you know, there's not enough time for me to even say that I don't want to go into. But the comment that I want to make is that because growing up, I just wanted I didn't care to have a lot of money. I always just wanted to have enough to, you know, take care of myself or, you know, whatever God called me to do. Now, going to high school and all of that, um, there was that thing of, you know, higher education. I didn't understand it. You know, I was just kind of one of those free spirits that was like, you know, if this is what I have to do, then this is, I guess this is part of what I have to do. Um, and so I, I did go to college, but through that, I was like, God, if this is what you're calling me to do, because I had this whole other mindset, you know, I was, you know, reading the spirit of prophecy. I was just, you know, thinking of housewife and I didn't need all of this education, all, you know, just crazy thinking, just not necessarily crazy thinking, but just all of those kind of conservative thoughts in that, in that aspect of that. So, um, when I did uh, in going to college, you know, I didn't know truly what I really wanted to be or anything like that, but I just relied upon God to provide If This is what the steps that he wanted me to take into whatever field I was supposed to go into. Then that's what I was going to do. And he provided for, um, the means throughout all my college years. I didn't have to spend a dime on that. And, you know, and of course, I was also blessed with having work after that, but I'm just saying for some people, that is the route that they're supposed to go on. For other people, it isn't. It just, it just really depends on those circumstances because I didn't have that, that in my mind. I didn't know all that I wanted to do or all that God was calling to be. I was very young minded in that. And, um, and I had that just mind that just, you know, this is temporary, just get me through what I need to get through and provide all that I need to just do what you're calling me to do. That's, that's the mindset that I had. And I didn't know the route that he was going to take me on. So all of it was just, you know, part of it, of course, you live in this world, you kind of have to, you know, go through the, the system a little bit of how things are accustomed here. But at the same time, your focus is on heaven and just doing God's will. So I think it really depends on people's circumstances because yeah, people do, you know, go to school for long years, you know, expecting a high paying job or whatever their motive is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that's not the case for everybody who's who's going through that experience. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. I think that what we're learning along the way especially in these last couple of years is how little we actually understood in God's mercy and the fact that we understood so little. And, and uh, I look back on my life and would I like to have done things different now that I know what I know? Would have done a lot of things different. God is merciful to bring us here. Yeah, I think today. everybody would have. Yeah, I think everybody would have, really. No, I wouldn't change a thing. Or, yeah. I truly believe if I, if anything uh, if if anything and anything was changed, then I wouldn't be where I am with him today. Well, amen, Sister Tony. I agree with that too. That is true. There are some things that I would I would want to change, you know. But at the same time, I do agree with you, Sister Tony, in that I would have in no other way, you know, that him I those college experiences, my school experiences, my work experiences, 
all of that prepared me for where I am today. All of those, all of that schooling experience prepared me for work. I did need some of those credentials to go into what I'm doing today. So, I mean, it, it was a all around um, blessing for me, you know, and stuff like, I didn't care how much I would make or whatever like that. You get what I'm saying? That, that if this is, if God has you in that place, where you are to be a blessing, then then he's calling you there for a reason, as well as helping you um, to draw closer to him. So you're you're to do what he's calling you to do to not only draw yourself closer to him, but also be a servant to other people, to be a blessing to people um, in had, those fields. You had said a long time ago, and and it stayed with me because it gave me um, a, it gave me a lot of hope, and it also gave me remembrance of how God has been um, merciful and always with us. And, you know, you were saying that it's our experiences that are going to glorify God because whatever our experiences were, whether they were good or whether they were bad, it's how God can turn a sinner into a saint. Amen. Amen. Well, Amen. to add to that or to express a thought a little, that I had in my head a little bit more, clearly is because I was literally just praying about this last night and this morning at 58 years old going on 59 understanding that my mind isn't as strong as it as it was when I was younger we all know that spirit of prophecy talks about that too the bible talks about our youth and how they were wasted years that's what I was talking about when I said that would I change things if I, I wish I would have come to the Lord and yes he was merciful with us and brought us to where we're at. But I look at the fact that I could have served him so much better if I had the young mind and I don't have that young mind anymore. And I do all that I can to protect my mind. But imagine what we could have done if we'd have given our youth as the Bible calls us to do, give us, give him our youth. And but that's I'm even not, if we knew him. Huh? That's even if we knew him. Yeah. And I did not give. I did not know him. I did not give my youth to him. And, um, and so now I'm trying to do, um, trying to do the, the work that a youth, you know, would be better suited for because I waxed myself old, older and, and not as, not as a ready, quick mind. So when I think about the lost souls out there and how I looked, how I lived my life, and I, I understand what Tony's saying because, yeah, there's things I wouldn't change either because they brought me to where I'm at. But knowing everything that I know, I also look back and think I wish I'd have given my youth to him. Yeah, God has, God has amazing, uh, he's amazing at uh, finding his way or making our, our life so that we would find a way towards him. So. Amen hard to predict what we have what we would have been but we just are thankful for what we have so if is it um if ministers feel if ministers feel that they are suffering hardship and privation in the cause of christ let them in in imagination visit the workshop where paul labored let them bear in mind that while this chosen man of God is fashioning the canvas, he's working for bread, which he has justly earned by his labors as an apostle. Work is a blessing, not a curse. A spirit of indolence destroys godliness and grieves the spirit of God. A stagnant pool is offensive, but a pure flowing stream spreads health and gladness over the land. Paul knew that those who neglect physical work soon become enfeebled. He desired to teach young ministers that by working with their hands, by, by bringing into exercise their muscles and sinews, they would become strong to endure the toils and privation that awaited them in the gospel field. And he realized that his own teachings would lack vitality and force if, if he did not keep all parts of the system properly exercised. The indolent forfeit of forfeit the the indolent forfeit the invaluable experience gained by a faithful performance of the common duties of life. Can, if you, can I cause, yeah. um, cut you off just for a second? I was rethinking that that paragraph you just read before 
because if I'm understanding correctly, he's, he's talking about this physical labor that actually helps the vitality in life. You know, something that many of us don't do, sit at a desk, right? Which mm -hmm. is why I've been kind of talking about us exercising, you know, who, depending on our circumstances, exercising. And um, because it's that, this, the, the system is your, the system of your body in keeping everything as, as a, what's the right word to use? Um, as strong as you possibly, as strong is not the right word I'm looking for, but as strong as you possibly can. And, and these are the things that have me looking at the squandered time and, and how I've squandered time. But, but how to keep the system, the body, the whole system properly exercised, mind, you know, your, your mental strength, your physical strength, your emotional strength, and your spiritual strength. And the physical work plays a role in in the spiritual and the emotional state yeah you know it's funny because before i got into this this movement i never hardly ever spent time sitting and being on the computers so i've never spent this much time on the computer and so it was really a learning curve because i've always felt like you know you need to get out and be active and moving you got the body needs to move you know yeah. And when you're sitting on a computer, like for hours and hours, mm -hmm. it's just not healthy. But, um, but I also know that God's work requires us to put countless hours on the computer, you know? That's the way we have to yeah. do it. I mean, that's the, that's the tool that we have now yeah. to do it. I mean, yeah. back then they didn't have such tools and no. they have tools to have access to all the data so to speak I mean, yeah. yeah you know it's like you have the whole world at your fingertips and even yeah. at this late of time in 2020 i have never really spent a lot of time on the computer and so this has been a learning curve for me too to sit at a computer and to you know take in all this information and stuff so it, you know it's a learning curve yeah sorry sister lena oh no that's fine so the indolent, the indolent forfeit the invaluable experience gained by, gained by a faithful performance of the common duties of life. Not a few, but thousands of human beings exist only to consume the benefits which God in his mercy bestows upon them. They forget to bring the Lord gratitude offerings for the riches he, had, he has entrusted to them. They forget that by trading wisely on the talents lent them, they are to be producers as well as consumers. If they comprehended the work that the Lord desires them to do as his helping hand, they would not shun responsibility. The usefulness of young men who feel that they are called by God to preach depends much upon the manner in which they enter upon their labors. Those who are chosen of God for the work of the ministry will give proof of their high calling and by every possible means will seek to develop into able workmen. They will endeavor to gain an experience that will fit them to plan, organize, and execute. Appreciating the sacredness of their calling, they will, by self-discipline, become more and still more like their master, revealing his goodness, love, and truth. And as they manifest earnestness in, proving, in improving the talents entrusted to them, the church should help them judiciously. Not all, who feel, um, not all who feel that they have been called to preach should be encouraged to throw themselves and their families at once upon the church for continuous financial support. There is danger that some of limited experience may be spoiled by flattery, by an unwise encouragement to expect full support independent of any serious effort on their part. The means dedicated to the extension of the work of God should not be consumed by men who desire to preach only, that they may receive support and thus gratify a selfish ambition for an easy life. Young men who desire to exercise their gifts in the work of ministry will find a helpful lesson in the example of Paul at Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, and other places. Although an eloquent speaker and chosen by God to do a special work, he was never above labor, nor did, nor did he ever weary of sacrificing for the cause he loved. Even unto this present hour, he wrote to 
Corinthians. We both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer. One of the greatest of human teachers, Paul cheerfully performed the lowliest as well as the highest duties. When in his service for the master, for the master, circumstances seemed to require it, he willingly labored at his trade. Nevertheless, he ever held himself ready to lay aside his sacred work in order to meet the opposition of the enemies of the gospel or to improve a special opportunity to win souls to Jesus. His zeal and industry are a rebuke to indolence and desire for ease. Is anybody, I know that we're in different places when it comes to Portugal, but has anybody watched the last one? Yeah, I, I think I did. I I did. We talked about that. Yes. We've been wrong every step of the way. And I'm just taking that into consideration with all our discussion and what we're reading and looking at when did God open up the truth? And granted, some of us weren't even born at that time. And um, But if you look at the reform line and each dispensation that's along the reform line and look at how we were wrong, that's, that's probably the point that I'm trying to make is it, when it comes to looking back, we didn't know. That's the fact. We did not know. But then I ask my own self, why didn't I know? Why didn't we know? You know, and we were just all works in progress, growing along the way. But it's now that I'm here that I look back and I think, I wish I'd have given myself more to the Lord. <laughs> you know, wish I'd have given myself more to the Lord. And thank God for his mercy that he is giving us this opportunity. If you look at 1989, because what he lays out is 1989, having, you know, the, um, having under, a wrong understanding of things, um, and then going to 9-11, having a wrong understanding of things, not understanding the, the, the issue at hand, and then going to 2014, not understanding the issue at hand. But here, God still, in his mercy, wakes us up that we can see and it's in that waking us up that then causes me i'll speak for myself to look back and see those wasted years and and by seeing what he has done and and doing all that he could for us to be you know on the right side of things with him and uh but in his mercy he wakes us up and it just it really touches my heart to think about then the squandered time so, you know, can I say something? Yeah. So I, I keep thinking, I, I keep thinking, you know, how you how you're saying that, and I'm trying to get it in my head and and um, use it for me. But what I what what I'm seeing is that um, yes, of course, we wish we had honored and served the Lord and and didn't do what we did in, instead. But God was apparently because God's in control of everything. We weren't ready for that. We weren't ready to be his yet. So he had to teach us a lot of things. Yeah, and babies now he reveals it to us. And he knows our hearts. So um, I understand that, yeah, we um, all wish we ha could have come to the Lord and served him well then. I just believe it wasn't our times. I think I'm trying to compare it to or think of it in terms of like Daniel, Daniel in Daniel 10, where he gets those three touches and he, he's able to look back or Isaiah, when he says, woe is me, I'm undone. Don't we do that now? Huh? Don't we do that now? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We, we, yeah. we look at it and see, we see his mercy in still giving us this great opportunity. But I mean, I look at it as, wow, I could have done so much more. And yeah, what, it is, yeah. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's... No, you, 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 you are, you are. It just, I'm thinking, uh, so then these are my thoughts as you say these things, because, you know, I want to, I want to, I don't want to think like you think, but I do understand. So I'm thinking, had I been thinking like that, and God did put us in, what if we got so burnt out? Maybe he knew we would have got so burnt out or so... Um, people were so against us that we just couldn't take it anymore and we failed. These are the times where we're not going to fail, where the church triumphed, you know? Well, I think it, to add to that, to, to, to look at it this way, to see it that way, 
but know that that he loves us anyways but it gives an extra drive to us mm -hmm. now where we're at to forsake all yeah because all those wasted years that we didn't forsake and we didn't know and yes he knew that we weren't ready all of those things but we can still look back and see wow how, how much blood is on my hands because i did this all wrong at every step of the way now what i need to do is get right with him and right. put the gospel and the salvation of souls ahead ahead of whatever i might think my basic needs are that's what i'm kind of trying to say go ahead sister adriana um i don't know certain things maybe god needs to wait until we're ready but certain things like in this movement he would have wished his church had never lost this information he, i'm pretty sure god would have wanted us to treat people okay. nice from the very beginning but his problem is he has to deal with us and we are so stubborn in our heads that it takes a really long time for him to bring us out of that mindset but he wishes it could happen as soon as it possibly could it's just us that make it last really long and ellen white and what you've seen in this movement if you keep doing that there's going to be a point where you're going to be lost because you're making it hold out so long so it's not you know if you're not ready you're not ready and then one day god says i don't care that you're not ready anymore you failed the test i gave you everything you needed and you're still you know not doing what you need to do there comes a point where okay you have to get, like come out of that now i've been giving you information all throughout your life this is this is time for you to get out of that so there is a point where the forbearance ends which the, they've also been looking at at the school of the prophet but yeah. there's certain things like i put in chat earlier the adversities i've had in my life i wouldn't change because they've made me who i am and they helped me to grow but certain things that i had misunderstandings about that caused me to treat people maybe a way I shouldn't have, that obviously I wish I could have changed from the very start because it wouldn't have conflicted with anything else that I was doing. So it's just uh, certain things that you wish you could change. Like again, idleness of time. I 100% agree with you, Elaine, because I can look back and say, wow, all of that time could have been spent helping other people find God. You know what I mean? Or learning or searching or studying or something, something useful for this purpose. And though we can't turn the clock back, we can allow that experience to have its effect on us that going forward, we have a greater understanding of what it means to forsake all. And that's been one of my prayers as well for the last few months, because we're, we're so I don't I dare I say it, but we're so part of this world that we need this part of the world out of us that we get under that we even need to be taught. What does it mean to forsake all? What does that mean? Does that mean not have a roof over your head? I mean, what does it mean? I think about those things. I don't know if anybody else does, but I think about those things and and, and what should I sacrifice? What should I give up? Should I, you know, I, I, I don't know if anybody else has any of these thoughts. I have a thought. Yeah. And I pray that um pray that the lord would be with me when i say this really quickly you know i'm not boasting or lifting myself up um so many things um god has taught me at a stoplight how to forgive and i forgave and that right there and then my life changed god taught me how to love other people and no matter what they look like how dirty they were he gave me a ministry for for a year or more just to feed and clothe the um um the homeless you know and, and and i can pray with them and and um read with them and i didn't even know them until it got up to where it was just blocks of homeless people on tents where i would just drop all kinds of stuff off that wasn't me that was the lord and there's a lot of things that have happened and i accept everything that happened and I don't blame not one person, not anyone I ever dated. You know, you always want to say, oh, it was his fault or whatever. But I believe God put me in every situation to make me a better person and to know and to see myself as I am. And all my life, ever since with my sister for 30 years, plus now my family too, he has taught me to surrender myself, to give my all, and to serve him. And I've always felt that I have been a servant, and I always will be a servant. 
and I'm not boasting myself, but this is why I love God so much, because he has taken me out of so much darkness and out of so many situations and was with me when I didn't even know him. And, and he preserved me. I should be looking like heck right now. I should not even be here. And anyway, I'm not busting. But God has done so much for me that I have learned to love, never judge. I have learned to forgive and, and just forget even. People can, can, um, can, you know, forgive, but they can't forget. But when you can forget too, that's a whole different experience. Amen. And then that's just what I want to say. Yeah, thank you. And praise the Lord. He just wants to put the finishing touches on us now for the with the gospel for, for all of us because I know I needed, I still need a lot of finishing touches. I Amen. Found- I sorry, just the last thing. I think it's important, Sister Elaine, and what you're talking about and having those experiences, experiences of reflecting upon um how you could have used the time before to do more for the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Like having those experiences of, of looking back and seeing, I mean, I think that's part of it because you can repent because you can see every, I think a lot of us comes to that experience where we recognize in our life that man, if only I would have done this, if only I, you know, um, and I believe Ellen G. White, she talks about redeeming the time. And I, I believe God and Prester was speaking on that for a reason, because there is a lot of time that has been lost through, through idleness or ignorance or many of those things. And praise God for his mercy and praise God for his grace and, and preserving us, you know, through all of that. But I do believe that it's all a learning experience and it's what you do with those experiences and how you react to it, respond to it now and redeeming that time that God uses it for his glory. Um, Can I say something real quick? Yeah. I just wanted to go back to Tony um, and she walked away right as I wanted to say this. Mm -hmm. But those of you who don't know her personally and haven't heard her stories, her life is like nothing you could imagine. The things that she has gone through have been so intense and so, I mean, really crazy and difficult. And right now, I know Tony, and now I'm understanding more of what Tony's been going through because my mom's been going through the same kind of nerve pain where her leg goes numb and the fire and all this stuff. And, you know, she endures pain all the time. So, Tony, you are very appreciated. And if people knew more about your story, I mean, you're, a, you're a, an example for all of us about enduring through difficult times and, and extreme pain and, and difficulty. So I, I want to thank you because I think about you a lot. Whenever I'm struggling through something, I'm like, Tony wouldn't have even complained one second. She would have. And just- I'm not trying to diminish. <laughs> I pray it doesn't sound like I'm trying to diminish. No, no, I'm not. I'm not commenting on your comment. I'm just trying to. I really liked what Tony said. Is all I'm trying to comment on. Yeah, okay. And so um, I just don't. If people knew, I still remember when you did your testimony back before the split. Um, they they put you on camera there to give your testimony. I don't know where that video went, but um, okay. I know when you told me your story, I was like really shocked of all the things you had to endure and i think it's a huge testament how far god can take you if you just have faith in him and i think that's the major point and if any time we are scared of well what if i can't endure this difficulty or that difficulty or i'm scared of i might be in physical pain or something like that there's tony sitting right there you go have a conversation with her and he'll she'll lead you right in the right direction (laughs) it's also i know taught her to trust um, a big thing that that takes a long time often and uh, but it's taught her to trust him by bringing her through it so lots of lots of different thoughts on it and I'm really thankful for the discussion I don't know where we were at um, I think it's the pole starts with pole set an example okay we can go on <laughs> Paul set an example against the sentiment when gaining influence in the church that the gospel could be proclaimed successfully only by those who were wholly freed from the necessity of physical toil. He illustrated in a practical way that 
what might be done by consecrated laymen in many places where the people were unacquainted with the truth of the gospel. His course has inspired many humble toilers with a desire to do what they could to advance the cause of God, while at the same time they supported themselves in daily labor. Aquila and Priscilla were not called to give their whole time to the ministry of the gospel, yet these humble laborers were used by God to show Apollos the way of truth more perfectly. The Lord employs various instrumentalities for the accomplishment of his purpose, and while some with special talents are chosen to devote all their energies to the work of teaching and preaching the gospel, many others upon whom human hands have never been laid in ordination are called to act an important part in soul saving. There is a large field open before the self-supporting gospel worker. Many may gain valuable experiences in ministry while toiling a portion of a time at some form of manual labor. And by this method, strong workers may be developed for important service in, need, in needy fields. The self-sacrificing servant of God who lab labors untiringly in, in word and doctrine carries on his heart a heavy burden. He does not measure his work by hours. His wages do not influence him in his labor, nor is he turned from his duty because of unfavorable conditions. From heaven he received his commission, and to heaven he looks for his recompense when the work entrusted to him is done. It is God's design that such workers shall be freed from unnecessary anxiety, that they may have full opportunity to obey the injunction of Paul to Timothy. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them. While they should be careful to exercise sufficiently to keep mind and body vigorous, yet it is not God's plan that they should be compelled to spend a large part of their time at secular employment. These faithful workers, though willing to spend and be spent for the gospel, are not exempt from temptation. When hampered and burdened with, with anxiety because of a failure on the part of the church of, to give them proper financial support, some are fiercely beset by the temper, tempter. When they see their labor so lightly prized, they become depressed. True, they look forward to the time of the judgment for their just award, and this uh, boy, boys, boys them up, boys them up. But meanwhile, their families must have food and clothing. If they could feel that they were released from their divine commission, they would willingly labor with their hands. But they realize that their time belongs to God, notwithstanding the short short-sightedness of those who should provide them with sufficient funds. They rise above the temptation to enter into pursuits by which they could soon place themselves beyond the reach of want, and they continue to labor for the advancement of the cause that is dearer to them than life itself. In order to do this, they may, however, be forced to follow the example of Paul and engaged for a time in manual labor while continuing to carry forward their ministerial work. This they do to advance not their own interests, but the interests of God's cause in, in the earth. There are times when it seems to the servant of God, seems to the servant of God impossible to do the work necessary to be done because of the lack of means to carry on a strong solid work. Some are fearful then that with the facilities at their command, they cannot do all they feel they feel it their duty to do. But if they advance in faith, the salvation of God will be revealed and prosperity will attend their efforts. He who has bidden his followers to go, go, go into all parts of the world will sustain every laborer who in obedience to his command seeks to proclaim his, could you move? Um, yeah, to proclaim his message. In the, up, in the upbuilding of his work, the Lord does not always make everything plain before his servants. He sometimes tries the confidence of his people by bringing about circumstances which compel them to move forward in faith. Often he brings them into straight and trying places 
and bids them, advan bids them advance when their feet seem to be touching the waters of Jordan. It is at such times when the prayers of his servants are sent to him in earnest faith that God opens the way before them and brings them out in a, into a large place. When God's messengers recognize their responsibilities towards the needy portions of the Lord's vineyard, and in the spirit of the master's worker, worker labor and unti labor untiringly for the conversion of souls, the angels of God will prepare the way before them and the means necessary for the carrying forward of the work will be provided. Those who are enlightened will give freely to support the work done in their behalf. They will respond liberally to every call for help and the Spirit of God will move upon their hearts to sustain the Lord's cause, not only in, in the home fields, but in the re regions beyond. Thus, strength will come to the working forces in other places, and the work of the Lord will advance in his own appointed way. Going back to the previous paragraph and the upbuilding of his work, the Lord does not always make everything plain. So we've been on this journey, kind of going back to what we were talking about, We've been on this journey and he didn't make everything plain. And, and that's been part of our struggle. Part of it is, is him not making everything plain. And then I look for my own self. Part of it is not, we, we didn't know what we ought to be doing. We were, you know, it was step by step that I learned. It's not like the Bible told me not to wear makeup, but there were different convictions that were coming to me about, where to spend my money and where to spend my time when it comes to being a steward. So he doesn't make everything plain, but he brings us to a place to trust him. Um, and then often he brings them to a straight or trying place and bids them advance when their feet seem to be touching the waters of the Jordan. So you, and you go back to the story of the priests with Joshua. It was when they put their feet in the water because they trusted him. The waters were raging and the Jordan overflows its banks in the springtime, but they put their feet in the water and it was then when the water parted. So there's a lot of good um, things to think about through this chapter. And so is that part of the experience, Sister Elaine? That's part of the experience to go step by step, right? That, that you know, everybody will have a testimony. Everybody will have something to bear and something to share about how God saved them yes and and that's part of the experience like not everybody was born as Christians not everybody came and and that's and amen that goes back to what sister Tony was was talking about and that you know your testimony is specific it, remember it's it's not about us it's not about you in every experience you go through in life you you didn't decide that you were to be born you know that was not in your choice of but you were here and so whatever family you were born into whatever skin you were color you were given whatever nationality you were given all of that was not your choice but what you do with the deals you're you're dealt with is is your experience and for that particular card that you display is to be a blessing for whoever god deems you can reach that somebody else can't. And, and that's why your experience is so special. Everybody's experience is so special because it's how God saved you and how you use all that God has given you to help somebody else. And those experiences are so important to everyone, the bad and the good, you know, the ugly too, because all of that is what makes you who you are today. I, I probably, I don't know, if you didn't go through the steps that you went through, Sister Elaine, I don't know where I would be. <laughs> you know, I don't know, you know, if I would have even known you, you know, or things like that. We just don't, we just don't know. And so everything is, is very important in our experiences of what we go through. Because I've had those same experience, those thoughts too. You know, like, man, if only I could have done this. But then I reflect on it that God has always told me that these experiences, sometimes these things that you're going through is not about you. It's because it's going to be a blessing to somebody else. You need this experience to help you to love on somebody.
so that they can see me and you. And now going forward, going back to something that Sister Adriana brought up, going forward, now that we can see um, how much wrong we had, because that's what we've been learning these past two years, is how wrong we've had things. And yes, those experiences, they, my experiences helped me. Um, I learned raising two kids by myself and no help from their dad, how to just really live on very little and try to get by on, on what you had and still nurture kids in a healthy environment. So there, there are different things that everybody had, different struggles that everybody had, but one thing that we're all facing, back to what Sister Adriana said, is there comes a time where now it's gonna be made plain, what are we gonna do going forward? And that's the part that I'm actually trying to focus on. Not, I'm not trying to discount our past and the need for them. It's looking at where we're at now and, and, and to go out to the Levites and to go out to the Nephilims, we have to, we have, to have it right. And if we're, if we're, myself, doing anything to cause a hindrance to my ability to understand and grasp and be the useful servant in the right way, those are the things I want to redeem the time on. So I hope that made sense. Yes. Amen. That I'm makes sense. I'm not trying to down our past yeah. experiences. I don't know if that's what I was hearing. So, and I don't mean it in a defensive way. I'm not trying to take away from that because we all had them and they, and I wouldn't change those either because they brought us to where we're at. But now it's time to look at where we're, where we're headed based on now that we've learned how much we had wrong and, and be able to redeem the time and get what we can right in our own selves so that we can faithfully and truly go out and be the tool in God's hands going forward. Yeah, so now we, now, now we need to um, diligently and, uh, to have the eyes to see to have the ears to hear and to have the heart to receive it because if god is the one bringing it to us and the leaders are giving it to us then we just have to believe and we have to trust in god's word because it doesn't come back void it's what it is we can't question a lot of people are still questioning and um yeah, yeah, that seems to be an issue yeah there are and um and struggling when it comes to the subject of equality and and right. uh, and it's i mean it seems really simple when we when we really how how hard it may have been to get us to this point it really seems simple human beings were created by god and were to were not to 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 hurt another human being and christ has been our example all along in doing that even though prior to all that we've learned here recently we had that conservative mindset of who was actually doing wrong and we've had to come and be humbled as to it was us that was really wrong <laughs> in so many instances and 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 seeing how we were actually causing harm now he wants to perfect all that so that we can truly be ready because i always rely back on joel chapter 2 the last verse that all that call upon the name of the lord shall be saved we weren't ready to receive all that we're going to call upon the name of the lord and in his mercy his great mercy something i was reading in psalm 33 today in his great mercy he knows what's in our heart and he will continue to help us if 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 what if what's in our heart is truly to help others then he then then he's truly going to show us what was wrong and give us that opportunity to correct it. Amen. Good study. Anybody other thoughts here? I just love this discussion. We always, uh, you know, it's just reading by, by myself is one thing, but it's a different thing when we discuss it together. It's wonderful. Thank you. I know I'd like to be the servant that Paul was, you know, <laughs> and, you know, we sing that song and pray that prayer to be, we want to be holy thine. And I ask him, 
I mean, I don't want anything to stand in the way. Oh, I, I think we, I stand in the way of my own self more than anything else of being wholly thine. And it, it forces me to be more conscious of everything that I do. Because everything that I do has in some way an impact on what's going to be for others down the road. Whether or not I have something to give, and I don't mean food or items, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's... If I have something to give or I don't because I neglected or misused, it comes down to being a steward of ourselves. Go ahead, Lana. No, it's just, it's, it's really, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's like every little, uh, there's, there's a number of quotes that um, that's, I think I saw on, you know, from you and from other people. And just, you know, by reading the Steps to Christ and, the, you know, Ellen White's works, it just becomes really clear that everything that we do, everything that we choose to, to follow the path of thought that we, that we choose, eventually results in some in, in a change of our path and we just want to we just want i i personally feel that there's so much things that could have done could, i could have done differently and uh, and they just turn well they they're turned for the good but imagine if they were if i did not do all those things that you know, he, we're just hindrance for people to come. And it just, it's its amazing. I mean, it's really, we really need to respect that God has, God will not forsake his uh, law of, um, you know, the natural law. The natural law is part of, is part and, and the reflection of a spiritual law. So, so he's not, what we saw, we will reap. We will reap. And uh, often we, there are so many things that could have happened differently. And I, I don't want to say whether they would be better or worse, but I just wanted to say that our thoughts and our words, our thoughts will result in our feelings and our feelings will result in our words and that will impact somebody else that we may not even, you know, realize and uh, it may change them or for the better or for good, or it may change us also when we say, you know, we utter things that we utter. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I totally agree with that. This has all been a part of our preparation. And, uh, but that preparation is to also, for me, bring me to that point to realize when I look back on the, I always worked with zeal and you'd think that the Lord wants zeal, but I more times than not had to pray that he would fix the mistakes I made along the way. And I look back at all the Walter Wright DVDs. I've talked about that before that I shared with people with zeal and all the people that I infected with that. And so he has to correct us, but in a, it's, it's, I don't know, I'm just really feeling truly blessed to even be a part of this because I know I don't deserve to be here. Yeah, me neither. And, uh, but the Bible tells us that no one deserves to be here. There are none good, no, not one. And that goes back to that Psalm that I read this morning that was so powerful about his mercy. And um, it's his mercy that is the hope that is in us, the reason for the hope that is in us, that nothing can save us but him. And, uh, and it's his mercy that we want to show to others. Because in that psalm, in the beginning of that psalm, it talks about um, for the righteous and the upright to go and praise and, and sing songs and sing songs, sing songs on the harp and on the psaltery, on the 10 stringed instrument, go sing songs and go sing praises. And then it goes on to tell you that by his word, the heavens were created. It's by his word that we've received his mercy because his word is taught us his mercy. And it's just a really powerful um, 
this powerful message this morning. Amen. His mercy makes me want to cry. You know, like yeah. I was listening to Desire of Ages, the first chapter, and just walking out in nature, and I just started bawling. You know, it's just like his mercy and his love just it just overwhelms you know me to the point of tears and of course none of us want to take that for granted and i think when we look back and we see that man there was so much time and now and we saw his mercy that we don't ever want to take for granted that mer his mercy and his kindness towards us and how seeing how he preserved us through all of that and still kept us you know and and has us where we are like that does drive someone to to not to be more mindful of their time to be mindful of being more of a better steward you know and doing good works and and treating people with true love you know it, it really does when you see how god treated you and and dealt with you it really does make you think about how you're using the time you have now to give back to him and 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 that reflects in how you treat other people, how you treat, of course, yourself and other people as well as him, you know? And so it's just really um, just beautiful in that. Elder Parminder makes a point in, um, I think it's in 102 or 103 in there um, when he's talking about Leviticus 26 and he goes on to talk about the, the history of the judges in there and how Moses is the one that set up the the system of the judges, and that was God's way to set it up with the system of the judges. And uh, even though the fault was on them, God takes responsibility because He's their Creator. And then He gives them another what gives them their way, let, allows them to see, okay, so you don't like my way. My way didn't work. I accept responsibility. I repent. My way didn't work, and now I'll let you have it your way. And then only to find out that their way didn't work either. But but just in the way he lays that study out, and then he makes a point that God desperately wants a relationship with us. And I don't mean just us, with man, humans, all of us. And uh, and look how much he's done to have that relationship with those that 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 come to him he's done a lot for us yeah i uh if i could if i could reread that um quote that i read i would think you would you're the one who posted it our redeemer thirst for recognition he hungers for the sympathy and love of those whom he has purchased with his own blood he longs with inexpressible desire that they should come to him and have life as the mother watches for the smile of recognition from her little child, which tells of the dawning of intelligence, so does Christ watch for the expression of grateful love, which shows that spiritual life has begun in the soul. Can you imagine that? Is when when you send this to me, I I read Desire of Ages a couple of times, and, but this sounds to me so brand new, like I've never read it before. It all sounds brand new to me. He thirsts for recognition from us. Yeah. Recognition, sympathy. And, Just and, to, and longs to see, you know, imagine the, t the people that you've tried to witness to in, in a uh, totally different than what you read in that passage. He longs to see that spark that says that life is, is, is now coming to you. You know what I mean? That yeah. spark. So we have conversations with people and we try to share and we long, but, but, but he's the one that knows how to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and, he is truly the great teacher to teach us how to do it. And it just, that passage put me in awe to, to, to see, because that's what we long for. If we really long for it, and I know we all do, then we have to come to this place where we recognize, which we have been, how wrong we had it. Yeah. And, and it's humbling. To turn us to him to say, teach me how to do it like you do it. I don't want to cause harm to anyone. 
you know, and I, I know I've caused harm to people in, in all the things I've understood wrong. And I can only pray that God would fix the things I've done wrong in trying to help others. And, and then going forward, help each and every one of us to do it right for the yeah. sake of those that are to come to Christ. And it is really a blessing and a privilege to be a part of this. And I'm thankful. I'm like you, Sister Lana, that book, when you read it, it's like, it's a whole new book in light of what we know now. It's really fascinating how a wrong worldview can totally eclipse all the information right from under your eyes. Yeah, yes. All down to perspective. Isn't that, that's like such a simple thing. On your perspective. Yeah, and it was all there. It was all there this whole time, but we were, what, what were we seeing? We had just a wrong perspective and it changed the whole picture of what we were looking at. Amen. Yeah, because we've read our Bibles. We've seen how kind Jesus was to everybody. We saw how loving he was. We saw how tender and pitiful and compassionate he was. And uh, I, I, I just, it, you're, you're right. It was always all there. And that takes yeah. back to the spiritual dull mind, you know? Yeah, well, it makes you realize the jewels were always are the, all there, but wrong ideas and wrong thoughts were the dust that just kind of covers them up. Yeah. Amen. And the dirt brush man has to come in and get rid of that dust. Yep. I believe when we realize how much the Lord has done for us and given us, you know, and has taught us, even though in, 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 in a situation, that's when we can really, I mean, if we really see and I mean, everything that the Lord has ever done for ourselves, that's how we will know and start um, caring and loving for one another because we were all horrible, you know? Amen. And they're, we're all his children. You know, not one of them is not his children. He loves them all, whether they're good, bad, whatever, you know? So. I wonder if it's also part of influence, you know, like, um, I, I wonder, like, if we read the Bible just simply, and I'm not just talking about like a thus day at the Lord, but with having this perspective and eyes of God and seeing his word, as we see Christ, we see what that, what he looks like, what he did, but I wonder if it's the influence of other people, you know, mind upon mind influence of how people you grew up seeing how people were treated or, or all of that, you know, influence of other people affected how you chose to see Jesus. I don't know if that makes sense, no, but I does, wonder if that plays a part. I think it does. Cause I was just thinking we had an idea of God, but since the equality issue came in, Parminder was pretty clear and it makes sense. You first have to love your fellow man to understand how to love God. And now that we're understanding how to love our fellow man and having that human to human interaction, now we're understanding how God works way better. Right. But you know what I'm saying? Like with little kids, little kids are innocent. They, you know, they treat everybody with just this innocence, you know, and, and love, you know, like they don't see really too much different. They're learning differences, but they really just want to be happy and they want to be other people to be happy, you know, and, and, and when they start to come around people and like, say they want to be, they want to befriend somebody who's a different color than them, or they want to befriend someone just with other differences than what they have or whatever. And then, and then somebody comes around them and say, no, you're not supposed to do that. That's not, that's not okay. You know, that takes away that influence of what that person just did to that child hurts them and how they now see other people and how they now treat other people. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? That, that when, that we can have a, a certain way that God bring, raises us up to see things how we're supposed to but because the 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 influence of somebody else or the thoughts of somebody else and how other people treat us based on how we act you know it 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 changes our way of how we um be around people 
Yeah. I don't know. I think that has a, I think that has a part to play in a lot of our experiences that if we were just to genuinely choose to love people as God, as Christ did without all the negative things of other people saying, ew, why are you hanging out with her? Ew, why are you talking to that person? You know, that would, and of course that person should be like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, like if you don't want to hang out with them, you should be able to speak up and say, I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to be loving to them no matter what. But many of us, you know, with all that peer pressure and all of that conformity type of stuff, it did impact us and how we then saw and treated people, you know, because everybody wants to do what's right. Everybody wants to, to make, do the right choice or fit in. And it's depending on what kind of group you want to fit into that it does a certain perspective can change the way you see things and behave. I don't know if that makes sense. But, but. Yeah, it does, Luna, be the desires of our hearts then that we would be like Christ in that passage, that, that we have such a yearning to be able to share something with somebody that causes a spark of, of eternal life in their heart and rejoice when we see it, have that unspeakable joy because in feeling that we've been fed because we fed somebody in a manner that a life sparked in them. If I said that correctly, I think you guys know what I meant. Who wants to close in prayer? I could. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for the Sabbath and um, the freedom that we still have to get together, <clears throat> and mostly the technology that's allowing that at this point. Um, I pray that we'll store up all these lessons that we've shared amongst each other for the coming week, however many weeks after that that we have left, that um, we'll use our experiences, our collective experiences and collective knowledge to <clears throat> not only better ourselves, but to help better other people. And I'm thankful for Elaine, even though she <laughs> kind of thinks that, you know, she squandered so many years. Um, I think she's more than made up for it with this group and these online interactions, which, you know, were originally, I think, originally her idea. Um, <clears throat> and um, they were something that whose time has definitely come and is now being utilized throughout the world in similar ways. Um, anyway, um, I thank you for all these things and for the great amount of light that we've see, received lately from <laughs> Elder Permander and Tess. And it's, for some of us, it's almost more than we can digest. Um, but I'm thankful for the videos and the ability to go over them. And right now, the extra time <clears throat> that we all have, some of us anyway, who are furloughed and no longer working, um, that it's allowed us to get caught up and to uh, know the things that are most important to be known now. Um, I thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. And um, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.